On August 23rd, the summer event Ahsoka arrives on Disney+. Plus. Witness the thrilling adventure of former Jedi Knight Ahsoka Tano as she uncovers a disturbing new threat to the galaxy far, far away. Don't miss the two-episode premiere event of the highly anticipated Star Wars series Ahsoka, streaming August 23rd, only on Disney+. Plus. Hi, I'm Chad. I'm a Gen X grown-up. I support Gen X Grown Up through Patreon, and you can too at patreon.com slash genxgrownup. No life, no fun. Don't you know that you're a grown up? Gen X Grown Up is a YouTube channel website and audio podcast you're listening to right now. All made for and by people who love exploring media, games, tech, and toys of yesterday and today through the eyes of Gen Xers who refuse to grow up. Your dinner cannot just be french fries. Welcome back, Gen X Grown Up Podcast listeners, to this backtrack edition of the Gen X Grown Up Podcast. I am John. Joining me, as always, is George. Hey, how's it going, guys? And Mo. Hey, everybody. In this episode, we'll be digging deep into the history of the king of premium cable channels, HBO, or the home box, box. office. <laughs> you can hear the song. I know, I can hear it, too. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Before we get into that, we have to do a quick update on what we're currently in the midst of, which is our fourth quarter, fourth listener drive. This is where we are running a contest to give you the opportunity to pick a backtrack of your very own. <laughs> this still gives, this keeps me up at night, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I have to tell you. This backtrack itself was inspired by a fourth listener email, but we're talking about, you literally get to say, John, Mo, George, you will be doing this backtrack about my favorite topic. Maybe you want to do <sighs> Hungry Hungry Hippos or Teddy Ruxpin or the history stop of tattoos. Okay, just just stop. Of fantasy. Stop. 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 Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying those things hoping they They're don't all pick them? Great or? possibilities. Good lord. I know. It's like it's like a guy's about to murder you and you're like, hey, you could poison me, or hey, you could shoot me in the head, or you could slap me in the stomach. I mean, like, why are you doing I'm behind this? the chainsaws? <laughs> All you have to do to give us such a hard time picking the backtrack you want, or maybe it's just literally an interesting topic you want to hear. All you have to do is recruit other listeners to listen to the podcast. Tell someone that hasn't heard us before about the show and have them email us at podcast at genxgrownup.com, giving you the credit saying, hey, Bob told me all about the show and I'm listening and uh, we'll add you to the list. We have a front runner. The winner right now has recruited five people. It only Ooh. takes six or more people to become the winner. So if you think you are the winner, you need to lay in your lead a little harder. If you think you are not yet in the lead, you just need to recruit a few more people. So you could be the one who picks the backtrack topic of your choice in 2020. We're going to run this through the end of the year. So get those cards and letters in. Have your recruit email us and we will get you on the roster. Well, let me tell you, I think since we're of an age where a lot of us are in, some of us at least are in somewhat positions of authority wherever we work. <laughs> so I would are, think are that- Are you going to suggest like, just force your underlings to- <laughs> Well, think, I say treat it like you do when your kid's selling something for their school. You always kind of stick the thing on your desk or stick it out there. Hey, you don't have to do this, but performance reviews are coming up next week. <laughs> Think about That's it. A little quid pro quo there. Nice. Very classy. Mo. Yeah. Nice. And you could get easily get six, seven people like that, right? Well, George would never stoop to that kind of behavior, no. would you, George? No. <laughs> <laughs> Only because he can't win. Otherwise, he'd already be doing it. Oh, I've got ways for me to win. Don't worry. I'm already working angles. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. So if you would like to be the winner, be sure you get those recruits in. You have until the end of the year and uh, we'll let you know how it is going. Speaking of fourth listeners, we got yet another iTunes review. I'm always impressed that somebody wow. uh, made their way through iTunes. That takes effort. I know do. it does. It really does. <laughs> so I really appreciate them. This one is from fourth listener Stu Monkey. S-T-U <laughs> Monkey. Stu Monkey. And his subject was rad to the bone, five-star review. Nice. That's wow. a nice start. Here's what Stu Monkey had to say. Love the topics, nostalgia, really informative with new media and tech. The guys flow together so well and are hilarious. George George reminds me of Costanza from <laughs> Seinfeld. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my God. Oh my God. No, I love Owen that. Wilson, George Costanza all at the same time. Hey, at least you're, you're, you know, you're, you're a man of many talents. Oh, Lord. <laughs> 
<laughs> it goes on to say the backtracks are even better. And where can I download all those 80s commercial and TV themes? Best <laughs> podcast and the best generation. Stumo. You get to download them every week when you download when you your download next episode podcast. of Genetic Podcast. You Kernel got it. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly do. Thank you for the review, oh, Stu Monkey. I so appreciate that. <laughs> those really help people to find us and we can see the growth as more and more reviews coming in. We're getting a little more traffic and it's really helping. So if you're a longtime listener, hit it up. Help us out. We sure would appreciate it. You know, the best part of that though is that we can still call George George and he has no idea what we're referencing. <laughs> and he doesn't know we're calling him George Costanza. Yeah, exactly. because I would never be able to figure that out. I've never yeah. been made fun of in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> Are you being sarcastic? I can't tell. No. <laughs> and, and that was it. You did it again. Just there. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, those, those are two sarcastic comments cancel each other out? I forget no, how that it's works. not a negative and a negative positive situation, no. 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 Oh, it's just, it's just There's no it. positive in any of this bullshit, <laughs> no, let me no. tell you. <laughs> Speaking of fourth listeners, again, I mentioned that this very backtrack was inspired by a fourth listener. And I have had that email on deck waiting for this backtrack. So let me quickly read you an email from fourth listener Huey, who wrote in to say, great stuff. This was from several months back, actually. Huey says, great stuff, guys. Love to listen to the podcast on my community back and forth to work. Have you guys ever talked about the free HBO Showtimer Cinemax weekends? My brother and I would have our whole weekend planned out on what movies we would watch. It'd really be the only time we could get access to great movies like Commando, Last Starfighter, and the like. Mm, Again, keep mm-hmm. up the good work, Huey. Thank you, Huey. We should do a show about that. We should do a show about that. You know what? That is such a good idea. I'm going to do it right now with us wow. as we record. <laughs> so what do you think? Let me tell yep. you. <laughs> Let's do it. Welcome to Home Box Office Subscription Television, bringing you great movies, sports events, and special programs, unedited and commercial free. It's good. Three channels, four if I was lucky to have a PBS. And that was how it was for a good long time. Yeah, it was a dark, dark time in history. <laughs> <laughs> so cable television was the cure for that. And HBO spawned out of that. So I thought we'd take just a second here to talk about the origin of cable because that was what paved the way for HBO. So cable mm-hmm. was this comic book character that was invented by Marvel. D- I, I in- think it's a different cable. It's a different it's cable. A different one. <laughs> Crap, I've got the wrong notes again. <laughs> just, <laughs> Damn it. You've done all this research and it turned out to be the Man. wrong cable. Can we just switch the episode to comic books now? No. That's not what Huey asked for. So Huey okay. wrote in asking yeah, about the here for Huey. So. Sorry, we're here for Huey, not for the Deadpool antagonist. <laughs> <laughs> See, I know a little bit about cable. <laughs> you do. You've seen a movie. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Cable originated in the U.S. about the same time in both Arkansas, Oregon, and Pennsylvania as early as 1948. Wow. Really? And it was, they had the same problem we did with the rabbit ears and the antenna. There were areas where you had, like it was mountainous uh, mm, and you could, sure. couldn't get good reception. It was really line of sight kind of stuff back then. It certainly was, right? It was about satellite. It was literally somebody had a tower broadcasting the station, just like you do today with radio or TV pre-cable. And there were places that were so kind of hilly and they couldn't get reception. So Jim Bob, who lived up on top of the hill, would put a community antenna and he would run wires to his neighbors so they could get the broadcast signal that he was getting. Kind of shared the geography benefit that he had. So that was really the origin of any kind. That was the concept of cable. You couldn't yeah, get the line of still in use where my family is from in Kentucky. There's still people who do that. Yeah. The run community antennas like that? Really? Yeah. Because, you know, they can't all afford direct TV or anything like that. So this is the next best option for them. And that started like late 40s, like 48. That kind of originated. Just a few years later, in early 50s, there were 70 cable systems. So different people kind of trying to do this around the country and over 14,000 subscribers. Now that sounds like a lot, but compared to the population of the country, that's nobody had cable basically. maybe, but compare it to the population of the United States that actually had televisions, then it it becomes a bigger percentage probably. Uh, That's that's a good point too. Yeah. Everybody didn't have four or five TVs around their house. They had maybe one that was a box in the living room. And that's not everybody even had that. I mean, I know plenty of people growing up back then. My parents talked about it all the time. They, there was like one TV in the whole town. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Let, let's go watch the TV. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Basically one what it TV. Was. Yeah, don't piss off the whoever owns it. That's for sure. The reason cable came about was because there was a lack of ability to actually catch what was broadcast in your area. But by the late 50s, those cable operators that spawned 
around the country started to leverage that ability to pick up distant broadcast signals. And it wasn't just about the ability to give you a signal that you can't get. It was about expanding the opportunities of what you could see. So you could show programming to people they couldn't otherwise access. You know, it was coming from hundreds of miles away. Otherwise, you would never pick it up with an antenna. So that's where cable morphed into that ability to, hey, you can now see what's coming from, you know, New York and what's coming from Chicago and Los Angeles, even if you live in the Midwest. So they were just daisy chaining TV signals, essentially. Yeah, it was the it was the Fido net of TV. They were just bouncing across the country. <laughs> we said there was 70 by 52. Ten years later, in 1962, 800 cable systems Ooh. were now serving nearly a million subscribers mm, in the U.S. Okay, now we're talking numbers here. Yeah, now you're getting somebody. And that was, there were several, like 800 different companies. So there weren't like the powerhouses there were, but there were some powerhouse names. Companies like Westinghouse, Teleprompter, Cox Media, they were all investing in the business and really kind of leveraging that tech to provide new content to people. Wow. Nice. Well, like any good thing, the government had to step in and say, hey, 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 this looks like uh, you guys are having too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is too much like free information for everybody. We can't have that. The next thing you're going to be making the internet. Cut it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because that's worked out so well. <laughs> right. <laughs> Certainly it has. The internet has just become this bastion of human goodness over the years, of course. I never see anything <laughs> negative on the internet. I don't know no. what you're looking at. Yeah. You I'm <laughs> looking at Apple iTunes reviews. That's the only negative experience I can think of. <laughs> so in the 70s, the FCC, they continued their restrictive policies by putting regulations on what cable operators could offer. They were like, you know what? That stuff that we broadcast, we have rules for a reason. So they cable was starting to, to dabble in, well, we can provide things that the FCC don't encompass, like, you know, violence and uh, nudity and adult situations and stuff, because they they had control over what you could put on the air. Right, because they were that wasn't really technically transmitted over the air. Well, that was so what they were I'm, arguing. I'm confused, though. All right, so the TV stations are what the cable companies are providing to its people. They're just providing them from distances, you know, far apart. Like you said, you live in Pennsylvania, now you can see something in New York. You live in Oregon, you can see something from Los Angeles, but they're not the ones creating the content. It's the TV stations who are already regulated by the FCC. So how, how did that change? So they were re rebroadcasting things that were coming from distances, but they were dabbling in creating their own kind of, you know, local oriented content. Cause now a television station that was local could say, I can create something that is not within the realm of the FCC's restrictions. And it has an audience up until then, if you didn't put it over the air, no one could see it. But with the advent of cable, there was now an underground. So so they didn't consider it being broadcast because they had to broadcast it to these cable company towers that picked it up and ran it through a cable. That wasn't well, part of the rule. I think this rule, is more along the lines of things like the, remember public access TV? I mean, we could do a sure. whole backtrack just on that. <laughs> right. And the weird local shows that would appear. I mean, that stuff was unregulated for the most part. Okay. As long as it doesn't go out over the air, because you could, you could run things straight in the cable and never broadcast it. And that was the realm the FCC couldn't get their grimy little fingers around and they were trying to regulate. Okay. I, I believe you, but it's like they had to broadcast it somewhere. They didn't have a cable running into their building from each cable provider. So it had to no, so, get broadcast so at some point. That's exactly the point. In some cases, they did have local origination content that did not go over the air. It went huh. straight into the cable. And okay. that was on the leading edge of what they were doing in the late 60s and early 70s. They released that kind of freeze on cables development then by 1972, which coincidentally is when HBO was founded in 1972. Ah, the plot thins. So to shine a little more light on it, George, let me just share with you what I learned in researching a little bit about okay. the origin Educate of HBO. Educate Grand Poobah of the cable <laughs> airwaves. Grand Poobah. <laughs> so in 1965, back before this uh, this FCC started restricting things, there was a guy named Charles Dolan who was, he'd been pioneering the use of cable to distribute television signals. They had a closed circuit, tourist information systems and things like that. And he worked in the New York metropolitan area. So he started to run cables throughout the lower Manhattan region uh, in New York City on a system called Sterling Information Services, later called Sterling Manhattan Cable. He was literally paying the city to add cables to run under the streets at a cost of nearly $300,000 per mile in Ooh. 1968 money, Man. a quarter of a million dollars per mile to run cable. And by 1971, he had a whopping 400 subscribers <laughs> <laughs> at 10 bucks a pop. And, and he was running in the red so, so hard. Oh, I imagine. So it, it was, once the FCC released their regulations on what you could broadcast on cable, it really kind of opened the door. So in 1973, Time Life Incorporated purchased 
conversion to 20% stock in his company. And that is what transitioned ultimately into becoming in Manhattan. It was called the Green Channel, where he would broadcast things on a closed circuit inside of there. And then it was founded November 8th, 1972 as Home Box Office or HBO. And it ultimately uh, went global. Wow. HBO was, that was like a rite of passage of my youth. Who had HBO? Wasn't it? What yeah. movies did you get to watch? You know, all that kind of stuff. It was such a change. Yeah. In 1975, HBO became the first American network to deliver its programming by satellite and thus oh, became really? the first national channel. So oh, really? they got oh, rid of wow. those airwaves of the FCC. Their content going up to the satellite, coming back down to the receivers and pumping out into your homes. So is that how they got around all the regulations? They could air any kind of content anytime they wanted to? I mean, even though I know they made choices to air certain content at certain times, but they did. Yeah, they didn't seem to have any rules that they had to follow by the FCC. Well, you're right. And it's, it's, it's a double whammy. So one was the FCC had, they had relaxed their restrictions on cable. And secondarily, they weren't using the FCC's airwaves anyway. They were going through satellite. Hmm. So that's how they were able to show content that otherwise would be restricted on normal broadcast television because they were a closed circuit. They were cable. Wow. Interesting. We said earlier in the introduction to this podcast, HBO, though it's something that people don't think of now, it actually stands for something, home box office, which implies mm-hmm. we like used to KFC go to a box office. Stands for Kentucky right. Fried Chicken. Yeah. <laughs> but, but does it anymore, right? It's one of those <laughs> things. It, it harkens back to when you actually walked up to a physical box office, which kids, that's where you buy tickets before you have Fandango. <laughs> <laughs> Not from your smartphone. Yeah. You see those no. lonely people in the glass boxes in front of movie theaters that aren't doing anything? <laughs> there they're there to sell tickets. There are those people anymore at my, any of my theaters in town. They don't have anybody behind a glass booth. They've got little kiosks and they've got one person checking your phone or tearing tickets that you printed out of the kiosk. Yep, yep. Mm. So much less of that. <laughs> Initially, HBO, they emphasized uncut commercial-free movies. Yeah. And from the very beginning, the very beginning, cable subscribers always had to pay extra for the channel. Oh, it was a time. hard sell. No one had done that before, but they said, you know what? For what we're doing, you're going to pay for it. So that yeah. meant not everybody had it. George, you said it was kind of a rite of passage. Do you remember, Mo, when you first got cable? More importantly, when you first got HBO. Yeah. So growing up in New York, there were a lot of channels compared to most other places in the country, I should say. But we got cable because, God, what was the reason? I think my dad got cable pretty early because he wanted to see like local sporting events kind of things because those are rolling short on cable a lot of times. All right. But then when we got HBO, I still remember, I don't remember the exact date, but I remember that somebody had a table set up in the lobby of our apartment building that they were hitting everybody that walked in and said, hey, we got this great new thing called HBO. And I remember walking past it on coming home from school and thinking, oh, great. Here's something else that somebody else is going to get. And my dad came upstairs and says, hey, guess what I just signed up for? Blew us away. <laughs> <laughs> he, he got suckered in. <laughs> he got suckered in, blew us away. And we, so we were one of the early people to get like before most of my friends, I had HBO, which was odd. But um, yeah, it was super early. I'm thinking it was probably late 70s. Yeah. George, do you have any memories of the first time you got HBO in your house? Yeah. Well, I, I have some all near hospital stories from the first time we got HBO in our house. Um, <laughs> when <laughs> I was very young, uh, it was definitely mid to late 70s when we got cable. And I remember very distinctly the way that HBO came across our local cable company was you hooked up your cable to your television as normal. But before it ran into the little coax adapter that you had to screw into the rabbit ears screws on the back of your TV because the TV didn't come with coax built in. Right. Back then. Yeah. You had a translation box had to, and turn into the right wires. The little module, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But before you did that, you had to screw it into this little white box on the top of the set. And oh, then the decoder box. From that, right? Yes. Well, and it, it wasn't a decoder box, so to speak. It was a shift, really. The signal was always there, but this shifter, you just, on one side, it was all the regular cable channels that we had. And I think at that time, there were probably like 15 or 20 cable channels on our local network here. But if you slid that little switch over to the other side of the box on channel three and only channel three, no other channels would work. But on channel three, you got HBO. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so, John, what was your I question j- again? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dick. <laughs> Did you remember when you first got HBO? So your dad oh, learned okay, it as a status you. I, symbol. I forgot, and so okay. I'm sorry, George. Continue. Yeah, you're not. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <it> hurts. 
So as I said at the beginning of my <laughs> diatribe, the mid to late 70s was when we got HBO. And the only reason why I said there was a near hospital experience because I remember distinctly we got it during the summer when I was out of school and I spent five days straight doing nothing but watching HBO. <laughs> Holy crap. Wow. Oh no. <laughs> All I did was I had like some soda next to me and mom would just bring me more soda as I was sitting there. I would get up for bathroom breaks once in a while but <laughs> I, 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 I didn't go to sleep. Nothing. And I remember like around the fifth day just kind of passing out and waking up in my bed. Somebody had oh. carried me over to it. I, I think I was probably like eight or nine years old or something like that. Wow. So it's safe to say you enjoyed HBO. <laughs> Incredibly so much. That's HBO is what has driven my love of film ever since. How about you, John? What was your experience? I can't hold a candle to that, quite no. frankly. <laughs> we lived in a very rural area, so we didn't have, I mean, we got really good TV reception on our antenna, but there was no cable out there. But my grandmother lived in town and they had cable there. That was before you could get cable anywhere on the planet, of course. So, I mean, she had cable because everybody in that area kind of did. And this had to be the late 70s, probably 76 or 77. And uh, they added HBO because it was one of those, it started with the free weekends that Huey talked about. Oh, and yeah. they said, oh, look, we can see these movies. And she got it. And so I could only watch HBO when I visited my grandmother's house. So many, many weekends, I would say, I'm going to go spend the weekend at grandma's house. I mean, grandma's <laughs> awesome at all. And she's the best cook ever. But I'm visiting to watch HBO because now I can watch all these movies. <laughs> with good food. So it's really, it was a it was a boom for my grandmother because she got to see me more often. She got to cook for me more often. And for me, it was great. I got to watch all these movies that I otherwise might not have seen. Yeah. You're watching HBO now 24 hours on weekends. The following feature has been rated R by the Motion Picture Association of America. It is intended for mature audiences and parental discretion is advised. Home box office will show this feature only at night. So we all three now as young men have some access to home box office. Mo right. has the early adoption cables running underneath the New York subway kind of situation going on. I've got my five days of pain from HBO. <laughs> John has his farm boys all huddled around his television. <laughs> at grandma's house. <laughs> right, at grandma's house. <laughs> but one of the things that probably gets talked about in every other podcast, so we might as well talk about it here, is HBO versus the box office. And I'm talking about not just the experience of going to a theater versus watching it at home because every human being on the planet now who has a television and has lived near a movie theater understands that experience. But I'm talking more about the newness of that experience when it first happened, when the first time you realized you could watch a movie, John, you mentioned it earlier, uncut and unedited yep. in its entirety on your television versus watching it on ABC or NBC where they cut out half the stuff. They would bleep all the cussing, no nudity, of course, or anything like that. HBO just presented you exactly what was in the theater just on a smaller screen, or at least we thought that at the time. I know there were TV ratio issues and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, So this was the beginning Pat of a scared, paradigm yeah. shift, to be sure. Right. There was a clear delineation. There was the theater. There was the mm -hmm. movies you would go to. <laughs> right. And then there was TV. There was Archie Bunker and the stuff we saw on TV. But movies were by God movies. And that, yeah. the only way to get that experience was there. As you said, you watch it on TV, it's a pale version of itself. Sure. And it was always considered like TV stars were lesser than movie stars, right? Right. They were, and movie stars, stars would not be on TV. No, that's yeah. poison. Yeah, you yeah it was go like, there. oh, don't do a TV series if you're a movie star. That'll ruin your movie career, right? Right. And, and before I realized there was an aspect ratio problem that they you always saw mm -hmm. the, this film has been modified to feature yeah. a TV. I didn't know what that meant back then. Right. God, I hated pan and scan. Ugh. So let's disregard the pan and scan that I didn't realize what I was missing at the point. But the reality was people started to realize, so I could go and pay $5.00 which would be taken at the time, $5 to watch this film in the theater. And have one seat only. And yeah, and sit in one little seat and pay too much for my concessions. Or if I'm willing to wait for two, three, five, six months, it's going to come right into my house. Yep. And theaters started to feel that crunch, but fast. Yeah. I think they did. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was, you notice like popcorn and snacks and everything. Yes, it was expensive when you go to theater, but I don't think as far as a ratio is concerned, it was as expensive as it became after cable television really started to take a bite out of theater profits. Because they had to try to make up the losses in exactly. volume and make it up with revenue from individual people who did show up yeah, still. Yeah, they lost volume, so they had to increase the price in order to make up that profit margin in order to stay afloat. And a lot of theaters didn't. We lost a lot of theaters in my town in that mid to late 80s era. And a large portion of it, talking with some of the guys who worked in the theaters, their bosses were always saying, 
nobody's coming to the theater anymore. Everybody's staying home. Well, yeah. also, I think it made a shift where theaters then started only showing like the the basically like the big blockbuster kind of things that they were more yeah. guaranteed the money. Right. Because- they couldn't afford running on four or five screens and running some art house thing because right. they had to bring people into the theater. Well, we talked about in a recent backtrack, we mentioned Jaws came out and that was the beginning of the blockbuster. The blockbuster summer film was an effort by Hollywood to create something that was a spectacle that forced you to want to see it on the big screen right. mm-hmm. because they're like, well, if it's just this little movie with people talking in a room, I can watch that on TV. The blockbuster was part of that push to try to win back some business. Yeah. I mean, I remember as a kid, movie theaters used to do things like they'd have their first showing, whatever it is. But then after that died down, they would either play like older movies or have a Bruce Lee series oh, that's right. thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Experiences. Yeah. Well, yeah the, the Iraqi horror experiences, trying right. to drive other ways to get traffic in. And, yeah. and we used to go to those because there was an alternative, right? I mean, yeah. that was the, that was the fun part. And so, yeah, I think HBO definitely changed that paradigm pretty seriously. Well, and I think one of the smartest things that HBO, you know, started off doing, and Huey mentioned this in his letter, are the free weekends, right? Yeah, I remember that so well. You don't have HBO well. that yeah. you can pay for yet, right? You know, it's like HBO, I think at that time, we were probably paying like an extra 10 bucks a month or something like yeah, that, maybe yeah, five. Yeah, like 10 or 15 bucks. Which compared yeah. to your cable bill at that time was a large portion of it. So it was like, wow, it's costing all this money for just this one channel. And mm-hmm. I only pay 20% more and I get 30 channels on the rest. But, you know, it was a premium. That's, you know, premium cable. That's what it was called. And the free weekends were such a smart way to get them. It was kind of like in the grocery store businesses that we owned. You always take the colorful sugary candy boxes and you put them mm-hmm. on the third or fourth shelf down because that's the child's eye level. And the yep. child would scream, oh, what lucky charms! And then the parent would have to buy it. And that was a tool of the trade in grocery stores. HBO figured that out and said, let's put on a free HBO weekend. The kids will watch it because it's a weekend when they're not in school, right? Yep. I yeah. think that was by design. Oh, It'll sure. also undercut movie theaters because when do most people go to the movie theaters? Mm-hmm. All the on the weekend. Yep. So we're going to hit two portions of this thing, grab people's attention. They put their best movies on, right? It was always the top movies were on oh, that mentioned that boy uh, even if you already had hbo mm-hmm. you look forward to the hbo free weekends because man the best stuff was going to be on that weekend yep. yeah they put a new release that they just got a hold of like oh we just got star wars well by golly star wars was going to be on a dozen times that weekend you know whatever exactly. was the biggest and hottest you knew the lineup that weekend was top tier and that certainly drove people to want hbo and i'm sure increase their subscriber count tenfold easily so it did its just job. by doing yeah. that simple thing yeah well we've learned doing Gen X Grown Up, it's about getting in front of people. If somebody will yep. look at it, you know, it's they'll never, ever be interested if they don't get in front of it first. And the, those free weekends said, oh, you don't think it's worth it? You know what? First one's free. <laughs> first one's free. So Check it out. Taste. I'll give you a taste. Yep. Here's exactly a taste. right. Yep. Here's your HBO baggy. Come back when it's empty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but on our Halloween backtrack, George, you mentioned many of those horror films that you saw were actually what you nicknamed HBO finds, like yes. movies that you first discovered or learned about through HBO. Mm-hmm. And through those free weekends or having it, there's got to be dozens of those. Well, I know specifically for me, there were three that I always think about when I think of my HBO finds, Halloween being one of them. And since you mentioned the horror podcast right. that we just did, yeah, yeah. Halloween was absolutely one of mine that I watched on HBO. I would not have gotten an opportunity to see it as early as I did had it not been for HBO. Another one that we've been talking a little bit about on the Gen X Grown Up Discord channel lately was Logan's Run. Logan's Run was oh, a yeah. classic sci-fi film. It became Came mm-hmm. a moderately okay TV series. I, I'm trying to be yeah. generous there because I like yeah. the movie so much. <laughs> that was the like the coming of age. You get a certain age kind of thing. Yeah, right. you hit Logan's a certain right. age yeah, and yeah. Then you okay. float up to the ceiling and you poof into a big bunch of fireworks. And sparkles. Applauds. Yeah, yeah, hey everybody, <laughs> yay! <laughs> But one of my favorites of all time, and it's still a really unheralded film. Uh, not a lot of people have seen it, but it's called Gallipoli. This was a World War One bio epic. It starred Mel Gibson in his second film role ever. Another gentleman named Mark Lee was actually the star of the film. And it's all about these Western Australian army guys who end up at the Battle of Gallipoli in World War One, supporting the British troops in this horribly misjudged battle. Like the British troops said, keep sending the Australians, even though their people were already ashore and didn't need the distraction anymore, right? And so, yeah. like, thousands of these guys died. I would have never seen that film had it not been for HBO. It was one of these 2 a.m. ones that was during that five-day run, <laughs> you know, because I was watching everything. I was, I was like, barely it, conscious. HBO but is on. I can't stop watching I, I'm it. I'm on my third two-liter of Mountain Dew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I saw so many of those films that I never would have even... Nowadays, right, you see an image on a streaming service, you click it, you watch,
watch it. You watch 10 minutes of it, you don't like it, you stop watching it. But back yeah. then you couldn't do that. You know, you had to you have some avenue you went to, to, be, the theater. to get that content. And HBO just, I was like, wow, I love that. I still remember one of the early movies was seeing things like, having the opportunity to see things like The Exorcist, which I still remember mm. like that came on and my dad would send me out of the room when it first came <laughs> up. <laughs> which of course, you know what that meant, Good right? parenting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you yeah. know what that meant for me is like, okay, I got to see this movie now. Of course, yeah. Back then, you know, if they had a top run movie, they showed it five times a day. Yeah, they, especially if they first got it. Yep. You're yeah, see lots they got of it. it. And it would be like on at like eight and then 10. Then it'd be on like at 3 a.m. or some crazy time. But anyway, I watched it to my, I really shouldn't have watched it. My dad was right. But still, <laughs> it made me want to watch those kinds of movies back then. You know, I mentioned when HBO first got Star Wars, I never saw Star Wars in the theater initially. So when it right. came out like 76, I think, something like that. 77. Okay. Yep. I remember vividly when HBO got Star Wars. That was a big deal. I, it really was. And mm-hmm. myself and, and a good friend down the street, we had a competition. So who could watch it more? <laughs> we had a running tally and we started to count like, all right, like well, got home and it was on. So I watched the last half. So we were watching Star Wars in fractions. Sure. <laughs> I watched the last half. Tomorrow I'll watch the first half. That'll count as one. I'm up to 13 and a half times. How many times have you seen it? So a lot of the films that I think we are a huge chunk of our mindset growing up as Generation Xers were thanks to the fact that we could rewatch some of the films that became a a big part of growing up in that era. We didn't just see them once in the theater. When they hit home box office and later VHS, we could rewatch and rewatch and rewatch them and absorb kind of through osmosis all of the the subtleties and the catchphrases and the truffle shuffles and all the things that exist (laughs) that might have been throwaways one time seen in the theater but became icons. I mean, it certainly helped, you know, establish the cult film movement. It helped that, I also think that our older brothers and sisters who were teenagers and driving themselves and maybe had jobs and stuff, they could go see a film in the theater four or five times and it was a status symbol. I've seen Star Wars six times. How many times have you seen it? Like you were talking Mm -hmm. about. But we could join in on that without the ability to go to a theater without right. the money to spend I on a ticket. I can't drive. I have no money. But I've but seen I can Star still watch Wars it. 13 and a half times. And right. So yeah. you could be a part of what you looked up to that your older siblings and friends were doing. I loved every bit of the HBO growth craze. And Mo, you mentioned you saw The Exorcist. Another great point I wanted to point out with HBO for us was you could not go to a theater if it was rated R. Yeah, right. Oh, good point, right? Yeah, you had to but be accompanied I could now by an adult. See films your parents wouldn't I'm take not you anyway. supposed to see yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is not for you. It's like, it's in my house. You can't tell me not to. My parents aren't home. I'm watching it. Mm-hmm. Now, for, yeah. better or for, worse, for better or for worse, Exorcist, <laughs> you know, Omen, <laughs> those kind of things. You know, and even if you didn't have HBO, I remember being at a friend's house that like had Cinemax or HBO and we're like, it's scrambled. And I'm like, this is, it's a dirty scene. I think I saw a nipple. Right. I'm trying to see through the scramble. <laughs> what is that? Are they naked? I think it is, you know? So yep. it, it brought into your home something that, uh, and I, I don't mean from a kind of a, salacious sense, but a as, as a kid, it brought you this taste of adulthood that otherwise would have been firewalled off from you. Since it was in my house, I could start to get a sense of what was going on in the broader world that I otherwise couldn't have gotten access to. Yeah. yeah. You know, these people picked a great time to get cable TV because right now I'm installing cable TV at special savings. And look what you get. All sports on ESPN. 24-hour news on CNN. And don't forget HBO with hit movies like Lethal Weapon and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. There's championship boxing and the best in comedy and superstar concerts. The biggest events of the season. And it all starts with installation at special savings. I'm sure you guys remember, though, like there was a point where HBO said, you know what? We got to actually come up with some like original stuff because they're paying somebody else for every, right. the rights to everything. <laughs> and also at the time, there was a really long lag from when a movie was in the theater to when it came on HBO. Like it wasn't like two weeks later to be in HBO. It was months and months and months, generally speaking. It could be painful. Yeah, yeah. it was a long and way. So back in, the, I think it was 1980s is when they actually started experimenting with original series and coming up with like their oh, yeah. own shows and stuff. One of the ones I remember fondly seeing very, very early on was the Young Comedian specials. Do you guys remember those? Sure. I remember Spotlight. I remember like HBO Spotlight. Was that a similar thing? It was similar. This was, they did it every year. I remember it because it aired on New Year's Eve every year and they would basically get like just young comedians. Like they would have some established comic would be the host and then everyone they brought up would be like a young up and coming comedian. But you saw people like Jerry Seinfeld, Robin Williams, all these people who were like young, like George Carlin would be the host because he was established. And the thing was, it was one of the few times or actually the only time on TV 
where you actually could see a real stand up, like as they actually perform them in clubs. Because you see things on Johnny Carson, all stuff. It's all right. Is an abbreviated version. It's, it's all tempered down too. It's a lot tamer like, and, and watered down. Right. Yeah. It's oh, yeah watered right. down. Whereas hey, HBO could actually show, you know, here's their stand up. And so I got to yeah. see. I mean, Andy Kaufman. I mean, all these people. Harry Anderson. I mean, all these young comedians are people who became huge later or or fairly well known. This wasn't a young comedian thing, but HBO was where I first saw Eddie Murphy's Delirious. Oh, yeah. Of course. So yeah, that same kind of thing. You know, you would never have gotten a chance to see that at a young age in a theater or it's certainly not on regular television. So, oh, you sure. know, at a point that you raised there, Mo, is that I hadn't thought of until we just kind of got into this here, which is up until HBO when they started running like their stand up comedy specials, mm-hmm. stand up comedy was the realm of a live environment. You went to a comedy club mm-hmm, or you right. went to a bar and there was a stand up comic or you saw just a snippet, like you said, on Johnny Carson, the late night show. But otherwise, you never saw a stand up routine unless you saw it live. HBO started to bring those into your home. And that was probably the beginning of my appreciation of like, oh, these aren't just funny people waiting to be on TV shows. Stand up comedy is a thing in and of itself. And they right. brought that into your home for you. Well, it was the first video version of it because before that you had your albums, right? That was yep. where you got oh, to true, listen to true. comedy routines were those albums that we get and you'd listen to them in your parents' basement snickering so they wouldn't hear you. <laughs> but HBO put it on your television where you could see the guy and see their motions and their mannerisms and everything. Yeah, so it was completely Gallagher. Different. I mean, he definitely see did Gallagher that smashing right. the watermelon. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> Gallagher on an album well doesn't work. The yeah. record thing. Yeah. <laughs> also, guys, we can't forget, I mean, we did a whole special on this one, which was Fraggle Rock. Yeah, 1983. Very first HBO original. Yeah. Spectacular. Yeah. Yeah. Jim Henson production. That was the first series produced by a cable company, HBO. That was the the spearhead. The first thing HBO ever did as a series was Fraggle Rock. And that kind of laid the groundwork. That's 83. That's crazy thinking about that. We can make our own stuff. And it's so amazing that that's the thing that kicked off stuff later on, like The Sopranos, right? How do we go from (laughs) Fraggle Rock to The Sopranos that, you know, HBO just, there's no way to link those two except for the fact that they're both HBO originals. Yeah, well, it was, they became a powerhouse. They were a premium. The benefit for them was, unlike network television, who ran an advertising, HBO had no advertising, but as you said, everybody was paying 10 or 15 bucks. Mm -hmm. So they had a budget to start creating their own stuff. And though it cost money to produce that stuff, they kept every nickel of the profit because yeah, they weren't right. paying anybody for rights. It was but also, stuff. they had the advantage of not having to follow the TV seasons. Not only for not better having worse. to follow the TV yeah. seasons, but also... I've read a lot of articles where some of those early writers and directors liked working for HBO better because they weren't censored at all. They didn't get yeah. notes from some corporate studio head who said, oh, oh you can't do this on the air. This will this will piss off our sponsor. It's like what Netflix has become now for a lot of these guys. Netflix is like, oh, do you have a story? Greenlit. You know, that's yeah, the way it, you know, yeah. Netflix <laughs> that's right. is because that's they want greenlit. content and the creators basically have free reign to do almost anything they want as long as they have a good idea. That's what HBO started off producing for our world. I remember hearing um, the interview of the guy, I think his name was Alan Ball, who did Six Feet Under. Okay, yeah. He yeah. said that one thing he liked was that one, HBO did not force him uh, on a timetable when he had to have the next season ready. So they were able to take right. their time and do the show they wanted to do and make sure they did it well, or at least to their what they wanted to do without having any extra pressure. If they wanted to have a season that had 10 episodes, they could have a season that had 10 episodes. You know, whereas mm-hmm. if they did TV, you had to have like the 13 or whatever the number they set in order to be even shown on TV at that time. So that inspired creative people to be their best creative selves. They weren't forced under a certain kind of structure. And so you got things like you said, George, The Sopranos and Mo, you mentioned Six Feet Under. And so many of those HBO originals were, I mean, they were so just, like the, the Wire, Deadwood. Yeah, oh my sure. God. Deadwood, oh, true Deadwood, blood. Amazing. More recently, yeah. like Game of Thrones, it just ended. Just look at the impact on pop culture the Game of Thrones had. That was an HBO original. Yeah. <laughs> Think about it comparing it toward like what would television networks do when they were producing their own content and stuff. They would do the after school specials or those movies, you know, that later on became the lifetime type movies and everything. And they were so watered yeah. down. Dun, and, dun, dun, oh, dun. the boy yeah, in the glass bubble. Exactly. <laughs> but HBO could be cutting edge because they were premium cable and they didn't have to to be beholden to the FCC or moral codes or ethics or anything. They could do whatever an artist could dream up. And I think that's what really grabbed the attention of the creators as well as the viewers. Because if you know you can watch something on HBO and you know it's not going to be bound by some laws or rules that Mm -hmm. other people think are right, but you don't necessarily agree with, it allows you to enjoy it that much more, I think. It becomes an entertainment roller coaster. It's like anything can happen. This this could go off Mm -hmm. the rails at any moment because I'm not inside of certain boundaries. And I 
credit HBO's kind of groundbreaking work on those things that opened up kind of this golden age of television we're in now. Oh, yeah. The, the, there wouldn't be, be things. Real quality. Yeah. The Fargo TV series yeah. and, uh, you know, Barry get and Shorty. Get Shorty and things yep. like that. The Breaking Bad. I mean, that oh, was, yeah. Breaking Bad could easily have been an HBO series. It would just happen easily. to be on FX. It was that kind of, we'll, we'll air it when we want. We're not confined by the FCC, kind of like broadcast television things. And they end up with better stories because it's creator more friendly. Well, also it was taking risks, right? And they were able, they yes. felt able to take more risks because they were just trying to, if, you know, all they care about was making something popular. Yeah. They weren't <laughs> even having to take risks. They already had the people subscribe to the service. If you've got the money in there enough that you can create your own series, you've already got the subscribers. You're earning money. Your only risk is maybe everybody unsubscribes, but unsubscribe, that's, that's the risk. Enough. <laughs> well, yeah. But like, but like any other subscription model, you're always after more subscribers, right? You're always trying to grow for I sure. I mean, like, yeah, you look at things like, you know, the Game of Thrones thing. I mean, that was a huge subscription boost for HBO. And so I think there is some risk. I in think that, people that, signed up just for that. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I know people do. I know those people. I've met them. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy 24-hour-a-day entertainment here on HBO. The following motion picture has been rated PG by the Motion Picture Association of America. Parental guidance is suggested. We've established pretty well that HBO laid the groundwork for so much creative stuff we see today in this uh, modern age of television. But today, HBO has evolved into more than it was when it came out. Now there's the battle between, well, what about cable versus streaming? Mm -hmm. And HBO, they didn't sit on their uh, their haunches there. They actually created their own streaming service, HBO Go, I know. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, they have HBO Go and they're trying to push it. We talked a lot about our own memories and the experiences we have. One thing that I'm kind of curious about to ask the two of you is do you even have HBO or HBO Go <laughs> right now compared to all the other subscription models and things that are out there to consume content on? I personally do not have any form of HBO and don't need it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, tell you, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's there's a lot of good TV out there right now being provided by a lot of people like that. You know, I mean, look, like you said, like Breaking Bad, that was a AMC show, which you didn't even need premium channel. You just got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a really high quality, fantastic show. You know, it's a great question, George. And from my perspective, HBO is like the TV Guide. Remember we did the backtrack on TV Guide? Sure. And we got to the end and said, do you know TV Guide is still a thing? And we're, and like, we're like, get really? out of town. Really? Yeah. It, really? It's evolved into something different. What it was when I was a kid and what it is now oh, don't totally necessarily different. mesh up in my mind. No, HBO not at all. was a critical thing that I had to have as a kid because that was how I could see movies. And I don't have H I don't have cable today. I don't have HBO any longer because frankly, it's thanks to the work HBO did to lay the kind of the bedrock that more broadcast television stuff can do and cable broadcast can do is the reason I don't need HBO today. Yeah. Yeah. I can see movies anywhere. There's great content anywhere. I give them major props for what they did to lay that foundation. But no, I don't have them either. Yeah, streaming is the king as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and it's, you know, they almost kind of worked themselves out of one job and into another. Oh, right? yeah, for HBO sure. Yeah. was home box office. It was, like you said, the movie platform. Now they're really an originals platform because yeah. there's no point in subscribing to HBO if you're only looking to watch films. If no, you're looking right. to watch films, nope. there are much better, cheaper, easier options options out there that deliver more content mm -hmm. in an easier fashion than yeah, HBO does. That. Even HBO Go, right? There's oh, Netflix, sure. there's Amazon Prime, there's uh, Sling, this and there. Shutter is a new Disney one that you Plus, found recently. All these different things. Disney right. Plus yeah. is coming out. There's so many more ways to consume film style content that you don't need HBO. What it's become is Game of Thrones. Okay, Game of Thrones is over. What's the next <laughs> What's new thing you get people hooked on? <laughs> yeah. We to have force to have to at buy. least the yeah. one thing. Otherwise, they're really on a precarious cliff right now, I think. I it, think they're they? very yeah. close to... I mean, I know they have like a crap ton of variations of HBO now, but I think the generations that appreciate those variations are moving beyond the realm of needing it. And, and it's the more younger and more generation doesn't need it at all. They don't even yeah. like my kids. They don't think about HBO at all. They they think about Game of Thrones, but they've got yep. millions of ways to get it. They don't get it from HBO. Oh, I mean, right. I have to say, I think, I mean, I think it's all a good thing, though, because I think it's actually forcing these people to come out with quality content. Sure. Because they know if they don't, then they're going to lose people, lose subscribers. They're going to go. 
go. And like you said, in HBO, I mean, that's why I think some of these, like Netflix needs are paying like massive amounts of money to be able to get exclusive rights now to run things like The mm-hmm. Office or Friends or whatever, you know, because they know they have to, they, you know, they, they have to cater to us, which I like, whereas for the longest time, the power was on their side. Yeah, you just watch whatever the hell we create. You watch yep. whatever you want. <laughs> HBO maybe had one good movie a month sometimes that you wanted to And ultimately, they, they were beholden to the advertiser, not the viewer so much. You needed the right. viewership, but the advertiser was the one you had to make happy. And that's not the case with this sort of content. You know what we're seeing right now that we don't see in any other industry? So right now, how many different operating systems are out there that people use for their computers? Well, uh, like basically three, 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 three or three. four. Yeah, the, your the Linux distros, Windows and iOS. Your right, right. iOS yeah. and your yep. Windows, right? Yep. And when you talk about different cars, right? There's a whole bunch of car companies, but they're owned at the top level by these big giant parents like GM or whatever. Sure. And uh, you see that in so many different, even in cable, right? You said there were what, 800 of them at one point, John, you were talking about in the history different of companies. Yeah. Now there's like now 10 Comcast. maybe that dominate the <laughs> yeah. world, right? Yep. Yep. It's your Roadrunner, your Comcast, Xfinity. It just got a handful. But when right. it comes to these individual delivery providers, these different channels, if you want to call them that, they're not really channels anymore, but these different content providers, the thing that we're seeing is that competition is the best thing for the consumer. There are so many places you can go to get quality content now, and we all are benefiting the rewards of that. We're not paying $70 a month to get HBO anymore. We're no, paying $5 no. now to yeah. get Netflix or, so, you know, whatever. Shutter, or five bucks just to get yep. HBO Go, right? I mean, it's... Yeah, I love that that's how things have gone. I, I'm glad that HBO started the movement and moved us down this path, but I'm so happy that technology developed fast enough to allow competition to support the consumers enough that now we get it not only quality content but we get it at a much cheaper and more affordable price yeah yeah and, and, and so you mentioned george they they had to evolve they actually run seven different 24 hour stations now that are mm. all branded hbo man the east and the west and the hbo latino hbo signature hbo family all these different <laughs> ones like disney has disney family disney kids things like right. that so they so they realized they recognized that very thing that they had laid the groundwork for something that they weren't in the middle of anymore so they had to diversify and and find focus on certain audiences that couldn't get their content anywhere else. There was I mean, a bunch heck, of shuffling around. Street now. <laughs> HBO yeah, right. Sesame yeah. Street. Yeah. 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 They're uh, they're now a subsidiary of Warner Media Entertainment and they have over 140 million subscribers still. So while there's a lot of cable cutting going on, they're doing okay. They're not dying yet. I think they're they, not uh, dead yet. They're but evolving. 140 million is probably not the percentage that they would like to be in. Right? No, no, they would like a much larger. Wide, and there's <laughs> right. quite a few. You know, you talked about the numbers earlier and we were talking about how the percentage is related to how many televisions were really in a home. There's a crap ton more devices now because it's not even televisions anymore, right? It's your tablet, That's it's true. your phone, yep. it's your laptop. Course. There's a hell of a lot more than 140 million devices out there. To only have 140 million subscribers, I'm not saying they're dying, but mm, they're not doing as good as You know, Netflix. it's more subscribers than we've got, so we'll give them that. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> and we're free for God's sake. And we're free. I know. <laughs> Has Saturday night lost its magic? Boy, you girls sure are cute. <laughs> uh-huh. And I don't eat meat because <laughs> I'm a veterinarian. <laughs> oh, boy. You know what I'm talking about? Not a clue. Honey, you look finer than a new set of snow tires. You know, you just might want to stay home with HBO Saturday Nights. I've never before seen on HBO movie every Saturday night, 52 Saturday nights a year. Guaranteed. If there was anything in this show you'd like to learn more about, the show notes which accompany each episode are full of links to click and explore. Catch up on past episodes and get pinged every time a new one's released by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. And you know, iTunes reviews help more than you know. So if you haven't yet, please rate and review us in the iTunes app. And if you have a friend who isn't yet listening, why not? Tell them about us. They'll thank you later. You're our fourth listener, and we'd love to read your emails right here on the show. So hit us up at podcast at genxgrownup.com. And finally, Gen X Grown Up is more than just this podcast. Our YouTube channel has hundreds of videos ready for you to enjoy. Plus, you can find our entire body of work on genxgrownup.com. Since HBO has got us uh, totally dominated in the number of subscribers and the 140 million mark, I think we'll uh, we'll stop patting them on the back and get back to doing work for Gen X Grown Up. <laughs> Before we leave, I always like to take just a moment here at the end of the show and give my heartfelt appreciation to all the patrons who support us over on Patreon.com. These are folks who literally take a few dollars out of their pocket every month to support what we do. They believe in us enough to say, here's a few bucks. Thank you. Keep doing it. And I'm talking about you, Agile, Chad, Blasted or Stash 
Rich T and Mike, Stuart, Corey, Marcus, Dan, Slobo, Greg Z, John with an H, Levi, Will, Dan, Greg L, Thomas, and T2. Each and every one of those folks, so, so grateful for you. If you would like to join them and at certain levels, you can get some little bonus perks, some extras, some behind the scenes stuff, head over to patreon.com slash Gen X Grown Up. Click on the button and you'll be part of the list. We would love to have you and so grateful for that. <laughs> Before we leave, just a quick reminder of our fourth quarter, fourth listener promotion that we're running. If you want to dictate a backtrack that we do in the new year, 2020, be sure you recruit somebody and have them hit us up on our email at podcast at Gen X Grown Up. Can't wait. Can't wait to find out what's going to piss yeah, off no, George yeah, and Lena. We can I, wait. I, I, <laughs> Yeah, it's like, I got too many N acids right now going on just because <laughs> Mo just Could had a colonoscopy anything. for crying I know. out loud. Jeez, I mean, come He's on. had enough pain in his life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's going to be the backtrack. Gen X grown up discusses colonoscopies. <laughs> <laughs> Would you quit putting ideas in their minds? I know. Just just stop it. it. Stop it. Uh, we will be back in two weeks with another backtrack, but next week with a regular edition of our show. We hope to see you then. Until then, I am John. George, thanks for being here. Yes, sir. Mo, always appreciate you. Always fun, man. And fourth listener, you know we appreciate you most of all, and we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. See you guys. Take care, everybody. No life, no fun. Don't you know that you're a grown-up? Gen X Grown Up is a member of the Evergreen Podcast family. Learn more at evergreenpodcasts.com. We're also an affiliate of the Geeks Worldwide Radio Network. You can check them out at the GWW.com. You will become the man who in 2020 gets to choose exactly what podcast. Or woman. Doesn't or have woman. to just be That's a man. That's right. Yes, let's <laughs> be true. I'll, I'll do it again. So. <laughs> It's called Gallipoli. Oh, yeah. That's with Dustin Mel Hoffman, Gibson's right? second film. No, not no, no, Dustin Oh, I was thinking different. I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no I'm this a different is... movie. Totally different movie. Sorry. <laughs> Scratch that. Move on. Get the promo a quick once over and we're done. Let me know when I'm you're good. good. We should have the promo no. just be us saying this, the theme. Like, da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs>